Hello and welcome everyone to Generally Irritable on this fabulous, fabulous Monday evening. Oh, I hear a little echo now. Do you hear that, Anne? No. Is that just in my headphones? Hey guys, let me know in the chat feature if you can hear that echo so we can make sure that we've got um, that figured out. As always, we are live on YouTube and Facebook. So feel free to uh, put your questions in the comment section for my special guest this evening, Miss Ann Hassel. Um, now, I have introduced you a couple of different ways to different people. And I have said you're an anti commercialization, you know, cannabis commercialization activist. I don't know if that's the right thing uh, to say or to title you as, but you are sounding the alarm about some issues with cannabis commercialization. Yes, I am. I like to say I'm a physical therapist who cares about human health. And I, like I was a bud tender. I was a bud tender. And from what I saw working in the industry, I'm very concerned. Got it. Okay. So, Anne, I am super happy that you're here today. I had a um, the Libertarian Party chair on about a month or two ago. I'm now I'm trying to remember when. And we just talked about, you know, the libertarian position on legalization of marijuana and other drugs, just generally speaking as like a, um, a matter of politics and government and things like that. But we didn't really talk about any of the moral questions. We didn't talk about any of the health uh, questions really. And I, I'm really glad that you were willing to come on because I feel like the the side of the anti-commercialization doesn't really get a fair hearing when it comes to the media. Uh, how hard of a time have you had getting your message out, uh, talking about you know the the trouble that you saw with commercial cannabis in Massachusetts? Well, I've reached out to. Uh national journalists, even someone, um, Amanda Lewis in the Rolling Stone, because she wrote about these people who are crusading against the pesticides and marijuana. Mm. And I wrote her, I sent her the same information I sent you and, and even more. And she just said, Oh, well, that's amazing. I can't believe that. So people don't want to show the negatives because this is so new. It's a hot topic. It's, it's got so many people, I think actually duped as to what actually is being sold to people. Yes, I think that a uh, very uh, good point. Uh, Alice says, are you against marijuana? I hope so. <laughs> are you asking me or are you asking Anne that, Alice? Um, you know, I think a good place to start is, you know, we were talking about this a little bit before we went live. And now you are not saying that you want prohibition on marijuana. You're not saying it should all be and you know, we should burn it all and nobody should get to to uh, partake in cannabis. What you're saying, what you're really concerned about is informed consent and and really the corporate and political corruption that comes from commercialization. Did I did I characterize your position correctly? Well, I have evolved in my position. I personally, once I stopped using marijuana, and reading more of the scientific research, that changed my thought on it. But I, again, am someone who used marijuana for decades. I got arrested for growing marijuana in Virginia. I was facing five to 25 years for 12 plants. Oh, my God. So, yes. So, and I served a month in jail. I've been jailed for marijuana. So I was someone who really believed in marijuana and looked to it to be legal. I voted for medical and recreational legalization. Um, at this point, I feel I'm very much against the commercialized industry and the harm, and they're perpetuating harmful, super potent products, and people have no idea what they voted for. I didn't mm. know when I voted for recreational marijuana, it was going to be the whole plant, including these high potency THC concentrates, and those are adverse for people, Erica. So let's, so let's put a pin in the high THC stuff for just a second. Because I want to, I want you to take a moment, if you would, and and just give people a little bit of your history, where you come from. Now you shared with us that you had grown previously, and that you um, that you served some time even for it. Yep. Um, I wonder, will your has Virginia legalized weed yet? 
No, I think they're doing recreational. They have medical. That's good. That's probably coming up because by and large, I see um, Virginia. It, it, it's enticing. People look at the tax money. They think of social justice. It's a whole yeah. complex thing involved. Well, As I wondered. For, I wondered if you might be able to get your record expunged. That's what I'm. I was going to ask oh, if you'd gone through that process at all. I did have it expunged because what happened was I was a 20 year old with no criminal background at all, and I think they felt sorry for me knowing that that felony would be on my record. So they actually did expunge it back then. Okay. So I am sympathetic, but because I know people have been un have been targeted, mm -hmm. if you look at certain minorities, but that doesn't give the right of states and for a predatory destructive industry to just steamroll America. That's good. So now, okay, so just for, for the record, just to establish for everybody listening, I am not for or against uh, I know people who have been harmed by marijuana. I know people who have uh, psychiatric issues who I've watched them. Uh, unfortunately, I was present while they smoked and went crazy. I mean, not went crazy. They, they had, and, and that's very rude to say, this young man that I was with had schizophrenia and he smoked and it started whatever right. that process is. Um, but I also know people who have had cancer and uh, or other medical illnesses that were really helped by uh, medical marijuana rather than taking like opioids or something like that. So I am neither for or against. I am Switzerland on this topic. Um, although doing the research for this show was was pretty disturbing. Um, so just give people a little bit more of your background. Um, so we know that you grew some plants uh, and that you have a background in physical therapy. Why don't you share just for a couple minutes about, you know, why you came to be a bud tender, what that meant for you and, and, you know, why you were looking into it in the first place? Well, as I said, I, consumed marijuana. I was arrested for growing in Virginia. And I later, I actually did continue to grow, you know, now and then. I strongly believe that it was helping me. It was uh, what I thought was something that, you know, relaxed me. And what happened was I became a physical therapist, but I, I was just drawn to marijuana. You might know a lot of people. They are drawn to the marijuana plant. For them, uh, you said you've known people who had adverse effects, but you might know people where it is their focus. And that oh, was yeah. kind of how I was. Oh yeah. And they've um, got the, they've got the yeah. sweatshirts that have <laughs> weed flat leaves all over it. And they're wearing weed earrings and their whole life yeah. is I'm about weed, you know? Well, I was like that, but maybe more, but, but I was also a physical <laughs> therapist. Um, but I kept thinking, I, know, I actually had some patients I'd go see as a physical therapist and they'd say I'd have to get something out of their drawer and I'd see a pipe They're like that really helps me. And I thought, wow, you no, know, these people are telling me it helps them. And that's how I, I actually, when I applied to be a bud tender in September of um, when I got the position in September of 2015, a lot of people applied, Erica. It was like the third dispensary in my state. And I, I was one of 800 people. They, they hired 25. So I remember just being so proud of myself because I knew so much about marijuana. Mm -hmm. I loved marijuana. Marijuana was my life. And here I was going into the green rush and I mm -hmm. knew so much about it. I felt like I'd, you know, had had that, you know, been incarcerated from it, but now it, it turned around. I was just so yeah. happy. You'd arrived so started, as yeah, they say. I, arrived. I was ready for the green rush. And um, I took the position as a registered marijuana dispensary agent, which is a bud tender, more or less. I probably would have been a cultivator if there was actually a, a location near me, but I was glad to be a bud tender. I liked patients. I have, I feel like a good rapport with people. And I was just, again, I easily, I totally just aced the um, interview, the role play, because I knew so much about marijuana. Um, but going to work there, there were just some signs before about how the CEO of my cor corporation had been caught in a lie. Mm. And right there, I thought, and he al they almost did not get the licenses because the state said, if anyone lies on the application, they're not going to get the license. That's what Deval Patrick said. Oh, what that was the matter. lie? Yep. He said that he had a college degree and he didn't have the college. He's like, oh, well, something happened. But it didn't sit right with me. And I just thought Who at the time, well, that? 
Yeah, why I'll, lie I'll, about I'll, something so obvious and uh, verifiable? Well, that was it because someone did verify and then he lied about when it was being verified. So that's even crazier. But he stepped down. But guess what? He actually still ran the company, even though he was told that he would not be. He ran the day to day. He was from Colorado. Um, so that didn't sit well with me. But I started working. It was a very it was a really dark place in a way. I, I just yeah. couldn't understand. It was I guess they they were almost secretive and just just very close, but I thought they're worried about having a marijuana business. I don't know what's going on. But when I saw actually mold in the container and the bins, I just thought to myself, this should not be happening. Yeah. It should not be so, happening. So how long were you working there before you started to kind of get a bad vibe or a bad feeling about what was going on? Definitely. I'd say by the third month I was, and I also, wow. at that point, I went to the cultivation center. I was so excited because I had, I wanted to like be in the, with the plants. I wanted to trim the marijuana that I had done before so many times and get paid for it. I was just so happy. Uh, we go to the cultivation center and they have this airlock. So it's something that you step into this space and it blasts you with air. And oh, like, I think this makes people think, oh, well, this is just taking care of everything. <laughs> like it's a clean room or something. Oh, like you're going into the, the make microchips yeah. at IBM or something. <laughs> Yeah, but that's what it was. It was very, and you had to do a dance. It even said, do a dance. So what happened was I walked off the air. When I got through that airlock, it was very humid. It blasted in my face. And I kept thinking, mm. and it almost that, that rotting fruit smell. I don't know if you've ever smelled like marijuana mm. that is rotting, but it was humidity. And I just thought, well, that's strange. Mm. And then when they sent me to trim, of course, I had some other crazy where I learned things weren't right when I was working in the kitchen. But when I went to the cultivate, when I was trimming, that's when I saw all the mold. And I trim moldy bud for eight hours. And I said to them, excuse me, there's, there's powdered mildew all over. What will I do? They're like, trim around it. And that. When <sighs> now, yeah. what is there? Do you know, is it different kinds of mold that can grow on marijuana? Or was it all different kinds of mold? Well, what I mostly saw was powdered mildew. And what happens is if people mm. look that up, it's very pervasive in the industry. You have high humidity. It doesn't help when you have 40 like halide lights just strung up from the ceiling with sheetrock. Okay, that's what the operation was, sheetrock. <laughs> and they couldn't even uh, go for some hardy back or something like that. Like they put in bathrooms, they just put up regular sheetrock. Sheet yes, it was sheetrock. Yes, it was. And of course on paper, Erica, okay. they're gonna do this, they're gonna do this high tech cultivation center. Well, no, that's part of the thing people need to realize that it's all about maximizing their profits and if they can get away with it they'll do that. do that do you know what the effect is of if you smoke mold like what that does to your lungs or to your body well of course for the immunocompromised it's it's very serious for them but aspergillus that's a type of fungus it killed uh, at least one person in california so it can be lethal and wow the problem is so they, they decide that they can remediate the moldy marijuana um, and the way they do that is dunking it in the hydrogen peroxide, like I, like the cultivators told me, and I actually saw. Or um, also, what, the, what does smoking hydrogen peroxide do to you? That can't terrible. be good either. It is, and actually, that's part of what I told the state. I said the CDC says that you know consuming hydrogen peroxide, and actually, in that article that I sent you. It's hazardous to your health. People yeah. would taste it. I always wondered why when I started to smoke it, I would cough. It aggravated my throat. And um, again, I wanted to see the best Erica because they told me it was the art and science. And <laughs> I believed it. I mean. Well, and now, now we had that happen in Vermont too. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, the, oh my God, what's the dispensary downtown that you. Um, uh, Champlain um, Valley Dispensary. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, so so that that was a digger article that yes. exposed that that they also had a mold issue and a hydrogen peroxide solution. Yeah, I used to think that my corporation was an aberration. Then I realized it's the standard operating procedures across the entire country, Erica. That is really scary. And this is the thing that you know, like I said, when I was reading through the various articles and listening to people's testimony, I thought I've never heard any of this before, ever. Uh, you know, I 
I had a client in Los Angeles. It was a cannabis delivery company. I did their accounting. And so I knew, you know, he had told me that there were some shady dealings and that a lot of the people that he knew in the industry were uh, akin to mobsters, basically, rather than farmers yes. and the cultivators. And that I thought was really unfortunate. Well, it's the love of money, right? It's going to do things. And I have to say, um, there was a coalition of uh, growers in Vermont, organic growers, even um, social justice people who didn't want S54, the commercialization bill in Vermont to pass. They felt that it would be harming their interests and uh, mm. shutting them out. And that's what it's all about. It's going to be the big players, the Silicon Valley uh uh, venture capitalists. Those, those are the people going into this. Is it? Is it the bill uh, fifty four? That is the one that allows for uh, companies to get into each stage of the process, right? Uh, grower, uh, yep. processor, seller. Vertical integration is what they call it. Got it. Yep. Okay, so that allows for vertical integration, which basically means that it's going to squeeze out uh, any small time people who want to any any entrepreneurs any cannabis entrepreneurs who want to get into the industry they're going to be squeezed out in favor of these really large corporations that's how it's going to go because let's face it it's happened out west too like in, you can buy a gram for 15 dollars. maybe people dream of being those craft cultivators but how can they be when someone will be selling it for four dollars a gram and mm. people need to understand the craft cultivation it's not going to be what they think it is. I think everyone has high hopes for it, but I, it's just the, it's going to be dominated by the the money moneyed interests. And uh, you know, money. Anytime you're talking about money and an opportunity in an industry like this, where it's growing like crazy, there is so much room for corruption. Uh, there's there's actually a, an incentive structure created to be uh shady right because again if they can get 15 dollars a gram and the crop gets moldy they're not going to toss the whole thing out in massachusetts you have the pesticides even i think even as much of a problem is the mold it's very harmful for humans and those are not being monitored you have unethical people applying them we had a cultivation center using them illegally they get away with it because in our state the marijuana corporations drive their sample to the lab. But in your state, there are no independent labs. I believe that the marijuana corporations have the labs in house, which <laughs> I mean, they do. I think they, and I don't know why Vermont's doing that. That is okay. So hold on. So we're trusting the people who are yep. get, making it to yep. test it and make sure that yep. it's safe. Yes. Vermont is and at least we have our third party but Erica guess what these people get paid by the dispensaries and there's been out in California you had you know flour being tested and passing and it, it or not even being um, tested it was passed anyway people get lazy they all want their piece of the marijuana pie I, I some of the stuff is just it just boggles the mind especially in a state like Vermont that is so, you know, about small bit, or at least used to be uh, about small businesses, supporting the little guy, uh, entrepreneurship. We have one of the highest rates of small business ownership and entrepreneurship in the country, actually. And so this idea that they're setting it up so that these big corporations will be able to protect themselves and set the rules up is really very astonishing. And right. I mean, is Vermont ready? I mean, you actually, it's, I love going up there, by the way, I love Vermont, but I think you, you have so few people. Are you guys ready? Um, or is it going to be the foxes guarding the, the chicken coop? The hen house. Yep. yep. It's oh, going to yeah. happen. And everyone thinks they're going to do it right. Oh, uh, oh, we're going to do it right. Like an example. You're going to be better. Yeah. yeah. An example was, you know, you have the whole advertising. There was a legislator who did not want the advertising and the House bill did not have allow for advertising. Then it goes to the Senate. Now, all of a sudden, advertising is allowed. So what about 
the people. Like they say they want to reduce the adverse effects, but then they're they're going to just make it full fledged. I got to write that down. I'm going to take a note. And you don't you probably don't have an answer for this Ann, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Cuz advertising in the bill. It's in the it was put back in the bill. Um I'm going to look that up. Um it was put back in. And just uh, as a reminder to everyone, I'm here this evening with Ann Hassel. We're talking about the uh, implications of commercialization of cannabis in the state of Vermont. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to write them, type them in the chat in uh, Facebook or YouTube. Let us know what you're thinking, if you have anything to contribute, um, especially this, because Ann, if you don't know this, I'm going to look this up after, and I, I wish I had thought of it earlier. You don't happen to know if any of these large commercial operations or even small commercial operations donated to any political campaigns. Do you? You bet they did. They all do. I'm serious. You should look that up. I should have looked that up. Someone told me that I should have gone to a certain site and looked that up so I could tell you specifically. Yeah. But yes, in my state, they all receive money. I got to look that up because I have found, uh, you know, when you, when some nonsense passes the legislature, if you follow the money, you can see why. And there's a number of bills in Vermont, and I won't digress too much, um, where, you know, they pass these egregious laws that shock everyone. And, and then you look and you realize that they're some of the largest contributors to political campaigns in the state. And it's like, oh, well, now it makes sense. Now I understand why that's happening. Um, Okay, we we're talking about advertising that came back up in the yeah. Senate version of the bill. So, and the governor signed it. So it's the law. <sighs> yeah. Now I knew he was going to sign it. And I actually I liked it. I got to go meet the governor, which is more than happened in my state. And he listened, but I knew it was going to pass. There's just no yeah. holding it back, especially when you add in the social justice component. But as I said before, not only were various growers against it. Um, but also there was a, a, a social justice group. Justice for All was against this because mm -hmm. they know that it's going to be dominated by big money because that's big marijuana. Well, and that is the thing that I think was sort of the real kind of kick in the gut for a lot of people was this was billed as an opportunity to make things right and clean up the past for people who have criminal records because of cannabis and, you know, oh, we're going to make it so that people of color get in first because, you know, this and then that and whatever. And it's like all that just seems to have gotten sort of swept yeah. under the rug. Yeah. It's pot, smoke and mirrors. Actually, that's what they're doing. <laughs> it is. Pot, smoke and mirrors. That is amazing. I need to remember that one. Yeah. Um, and now, so there's obviously all this room for corporate corruption, um, it's been documented in, around the country, in California, in Colorado, in Massachusetts. Um, you know, my experience in California was that it was that it was really corrupt. Um, I also have a client in Texas who uh, does things with vaping, and they were asked to help with uh, some product in California because they already had the mechanism for creating all of the, you know, the pieces and whatever. And so blah, blah, blah. And um, they also, some of the nicest, kindest people you'll ever meet, uh, Christian family really uh, gives back to the community, is very involved. And they told me that they were super uncomfortable with the people that they were doing business with. And so like, almost everyone that I have personal experience with and personal knowledge of who has done anything in the cannabis industry has said that commercialization and the people involved in commercialization are shady, mob-like, corrupt, and make them make people feel like they want to take a shower after they've talked to them. You know, I'm sure there are probably, I guess there's some, I know that I know people who aren't on that level, but they're very rare. But again, I think it's dominated. Most of it, in my opinion, is how you describe it. Yeah, um, and A few people can perhaps get through, but no. It, 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 people need to understand if they're unscrupulous and shady, what kind of marijuana are they selling you? They make their money off of how much they, they provide and how much. Well, they and why, 
why would I want to go get something that is, um, you know, some, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact number um, that, you know, there's all these vape cartridges, like 20%. I could, I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that y'all. But I remember it was a lot, a uh, huge percentage of vape cartridges come from China. Yes. And I'm like, why would I, why would I want to go to a, a store let's say a, a marijuana dispensary and buy stuff that is made overseas uh, or out of state without any oversight. Apparently, you know, the FDA isn't checking any of this stuff. So there's no way to tell if it's good. They, we already know that they're lining. Well, okay, we'll keep the vape. No, I said I was going to wait on the vape stuff. So I le don't let me forget. Um, why wouldn't I just go keep going to the farmer down the street? You know, the, the guy that I've been getting it from for years, you know, he knows the farmer and the farmer is like organic and it's, you know, blah, blah. Like why, why would I participate in the legal market when the illegal market sounds like it's actually safer? Actually, uh, as with legalization, it has increased the illegal market across the board it really has because you bring up a good point why would you buy uh like in my in massachusetts an ounce for 420 dollars when you can get it from someone for 200 so they keep <laughs> saying that if we legalize it it's going to make it's going to reduce the black market but it only increases it and if you're bringing also you have to realize i don't know if you knew this erica there was a big bust out in uh, i think tacoma out in uh, Washington state. And you have cartels, you have people from China who are coming here and setting up grow houses. It happened in, um, actually in, it's happening in states. It even happened here in Massachusetts because again, it's the big draw, it's the money. But I bet you they're not doing a good product because again, it all comes down to uh, the weight of the yield. And it's just people have to understand just because you make it legal. Oh, it doesn't make all the problems evaporate. No, it, just, it magnifies the problems. Well, and this is oh, so this is we've got a question. Ray says, is there statistics on toxins with the underground sales like it's been for years in Vermont? So, like, do we know, Ray, correct me if I'm if I'm re paraphrasing incorrectly. So basically, do we know like. Uh, if, if the black market sales versus the, uh, dispensary, if the dispensary is using pesticides and hydrogen peroxide and all this other stuff, do we know what the black market folks are doing? Well, people would say to me, oh, it's so great. We have these dispensaries because now the product is so much safer. And I would just think they have no idea. Now, granted, you will have people using banned pesticides in terms of illegal growers too. But in my opinion, if you're going to tell people, oh, it's just so safe, that's my biggest problem. They're telling mm -hmm. people that the state is regulating this. It's and not so safe. And so therefore it's safe. And Got that it. makes people, it lays their fears, Erica. They think, oh, because it's legal and because they're regulating it, it's safe. And nothing could be farther from the truth. Uh, this almost is like, it's so interesting. I've ha been having a lot of conversations with people recently about informed consent, mm -hmm. um, health freedom and things like that, um, where for many years people talk about, oh, this is a conversation between me and my doctor and it's none of your business. And, you know, but then th there are certain things that they think it is their business. And okay, good, Eric, uh, Ray, thank you. Um, and so this idea that, you can trust the government to tell you what's safe. You can't or not. trust the government. I used to, Erica. I before I went to the mayor, went to work in the dispensary. I trusted all of my leaders and I trusted the government. Well, it was a tough wake up call because I realized they're not doing the right thing. Because again, the power they want the votes, the money because they're getting the money. They don't care about the average person, Erica. <laughs> now, there have been a number of corruption charges. So so not just corporate corruption, but political corruption, like you talked about, where uh, uh, public officials have been found to have taken bribes and things yes. like that. Yes. Um, in my state, the Fall River mayor had, um, who's taking bribes and had at least several hundred thousand dollars in his safe. And then you had also the Russian oligarchs wanted to make money. 
So they decided to get into, um, you know, make a deal with Cureleaf and try and get some licenses in, in California, Nevada, Nevada politicians. And it, it's just really upsetting to think that, I mean, these Vermont people must think, oh, it's, it's going to be about the farmer. It's going to be about the local. No, I think it's going to be about these um, multi-state operators that's what um, they build it as that that's yeah. what they build it to vermonters as oh it's gonna be oh it's gonna be safer oh it's gonna be look at us vermont and you know we've got this uh you know we've already got marijuana um uh what the heck do they call it tourism right there's already weed tourism in vermont now we're just gonna make money off of it Right. Do they have something like uh, the weedery instead of the winery or, you know, <laughs> I, I just don't think that eco, I don't think it's going to be people always, every single state thinks we are going to be the center of marijuana tourism. I mean, every state, like there's New Jersey, every, every city just thinks that's going to happen. Um, I, I don't think that's going to be evolving. You had the, it was interesting, you know, the Emerald Triangle out in California, that's been growing the most marijuana in California, mm. it's the Emerald Triangle, Mendocino, um, Trinity, and also Humboldt County. Well, okay. they voted against legalization because they wanted to preserve, you know, their livelihoods. Oh, and they knew what would happen. Yes, even the most pro-marijuana people voted against it because in California. the way the government works. Um, so Benjamin said, uh, also stocks, I'd be interested to see what politicians have money in cannabis and CBD stocks right now. Yep. Because, oh, yeah. What about John Boehner? will get $20 million if marijuana is nationalized federally. What? Yep. Shut up. Yeah. $20 million payout with, a, a, um, isn't he with Acreage Holdings with Governor, well, by Governor Weld? Yes. They are getting lots of money. And Nancy Pelosi's son is in the cannabis business. Did you know that? Oh, so the person who, um, at the same time, were struggling with COVID, yeah. and need to pass a COVID thing that they instead passed yeah. the legalization of marijuana in the House. Nancy Pelosi, yeah. that yeah. Nancy Pelosi, and her son is in the cannabis industry. How many people know this? <laughs> this is hysterical because for people who don't know, Congress does not have to abide by the same rules that we do as American citizens. So they can actually participate in insider trading. So that, so they're able to profit off of the legislation that they're writing on our backs. That's amazing. Right. Um, uh, oh, <laughs> Ray says it'll cost too much for tourists in Vermont. They'll bring their own. You know, I, I said the same thing. And we, we talked about this a little bit. The only people who are going to go down to the bevy and buy marijuana from the dispensary or whatever are tourists. Absolutely. The ski tourists. I know that happened out in uh, Colorado. And I actually went to a... Um, I went to a grow store and I, I was telling them because I, I had bought things from the grow store and I wanted to let them to know about the marijuana where I worked. And they knew all about it because they had other workers from my company in there. And then then he said, those people, I said, he's, I said, what about those poor people buying the product? And he's like, they deserve it. And I'm like, he's like, they deserve to be poisoned. And I said, really? What about people who don't know marijuana? I mean, I, I thought that was pretty heartless for that uh, gross store owner to tell me that. Oh what about God. the people, the older people? Now they're telling older people, you don't have any energy. You, your body has aches and pains. You're lonely. Use some marijuana. So they're going to these dispensaries and they don't know <laughs> that what good marijuana is. Actually, I don't think they do. Do you, do you remember? I, I'm not old enough to remember seeing them, but I've seen them where all of those old ads where it's like nine out of 10 doctors smoke camels <laughs> Or, you know, yeah. like your doctor prefers Marlboro. And I'm like, I just can imagine we're going to look back on marijuana ads in, you know, 20, 30, 50 years and laugh the same way at the ridiculousness of it. Well, you know, what bothers me about, you know, big tobacco is they were, it took over 80 years and they, they were before Congress and the CEOs were asked, is your product addicting no it's not and they all lie and i really yep. feel like that's what the marijuana industry is doing too and they did it with opioids yep absolutely well. and um in tj donovan our attorney general has even gone as far as to say that marijuana is not a gateway drug 
um, that, and I've heard people for years say that marijuana is not uh, addictive. And as a recovering addict and alcoholic, yeah. I, I would tell people who would try to say to me, oh, I don't like I'd sponsor people and they'd be like, I don't have to quit smoking weed because it's not addictive or people would argue with me that weed was not addictive. And I was like, if you believe that, then you've never been a weed smoker. That tells me you've never been a weed smoker. Actually, or, yeah. oh, go ahead. Actually, they call actually in the terms of the sobriety world. If you say I'm giving up everything except weed, that's California sobriety. <laughs> <laughs> that is good. So that's what they say. And um, like even my dispensary manual said that 9% of the population can get a cannabis use disorder. And you're describing the person who would smoke it. I've seen friends of mine actually go into a psychosis. There's something called cannabis induced psychosis. It's in the DSM-5. If you look it up, it's actually a medical and a, or a psychological issue. People don't understand this cannabis induced psychosis. That um, is amazing that we just, our own attorney general is out there saying things that are, that are demonstrably false. That that's concerning to me. Uh, and and so why, I, I don't know if he's just uninformed or again, it's inconvenient because guess what? He's a politician, right? He yeah. To, so there you go. Yep. Yep. People exactly. Do anything to stay in office or to go to a higher office. Oh, yes. Um, hold on. Hold on one second. And mom is asking for the link to the show tonight. My mom is a great supporter and watcher of my show. She's awesome. She always calls me up after and rants about whatever she thinks that we were talking about. Would you? You're so sweet, honey. My husband and producer, mom, Benjamin is sending you the link right now. She just texted me. So would you text her? I love you, honey. I have the best <laughs> husband in the whole wide world. I, I'm sure I've said that a thousand times, but I really do have the best husband in the whole wide world. Um, so so we know, in fact, that cannabis can cause, I mean, it's, it's classified as a hallucinogenic, if I yes. recall correctly. Yes. So we're not just talking about, like, cigarettes that uh, release a little norepinephrine in your brain. Yeah. We're talking about a chemical that can induce hallucinate, hallucinate, hallucinate. Wow. Why can't I talk today? Hallucinations and, uh, and psychosis. Uh, do, do we know if cigarettes do that? <laughs> cigarettes don't, I don't, alcohol doesn't do that. And unfortunately the young brain, especially, I didn't know this, but, until the age of 25, your brain is still forming and mm -hmm. there is a great deal of risk for young people, but the dispensaries are selling to 21 and older despite that. Mm -hmm. And Canada, I think it's 18 and older. It's so crazy what's going up there in Canada. So I wanna talk a little bit about the cartridges in particular, because this was a big topic. Uh, vaping was a big topic several years ago. Um, as I mentioned, I have a accounting client who does vape stuff. And I remember when they were going to start making them uh, go th like FDA process of their juices. And then there was a big push to ban vaping. And I thought to myself back then, because I didn't know and I didn't understand back then I thought, well, you know, I'm an ex smoker and my father died of lung cancer and I lifelong smoker. And, um, you know, I quit several years ago after my father died because I was like, I don't want to die like that. And, and I just kept thinking, you know, if people are quitting smoking, shouldn't we just be grateful rather than trying to ban the thing people are using to get off cigarettes? But it sounds like there's a lot of problems with product being shipped to the United States for vaping purposes. That's right, Erica. You described the hardware. I read in 2015, uh, the New York Times warned about it because mm -hmm. even my corporation, we had these terrible vape batteries. Those things would break all the time. I had a customer told me that his blew up, right? My God. Yes, and I actually documented that, included that in my list to the Department of Public Health and never heard back. 
one person actually was vaping and actually not um, from my corporation, but actually had um, you know, part of his jaw blow off. Because here you have, the, again, that device. You have this lithium ion battery. And people are puffing on this, not realizing, first of all, you have the hardware, which sometimes they coat the lead coil, the coil with lead to make it malleable. That's cheap. And then you have a, um, a cartridge you attach, right, that may have mm -hmm. that marijuana with pesticides and what heavy metals and, and mycotoxins. And then you also have, again, a solution like the propylene glycol, the uh, propyl propylethylene glycol. And those were, they actually, now Colorado's going to start banning some of those because they realize that that's harmful. As you described, you had that e vaping mysterious illness last year. And actually in my state, in Massachusetts, there were six instances of people who had e vaping who bought their products from a marijuana dispensary. So it's not just the black market. So back, I need you to back up for me a little bit so I can yep. understand the mechanisms. When you say there's something that you said is coated with lead. Right, the battery. So you have a, a coil okay. in the battery. And also- the And that's the thing. Yeah. Oh, sorry. What's that? That's that, um, the, the, the vape pen. I, I don't know if you've ever done like, it's, it looks like a little pen. It's the, yeah. it's the battery and you, and then you attach the cartridge to it. So it's the, so it's the coil that heats up yes. that makes the vape. Yes. Vape, and it's basically. got lead in it. What if it has, and no one's doing a test of, wow, let's see what happens when we draw from this vape device. And I know people in the cannabis uh, users and enthusiasts have been saying for some time, why are they not looking at that? So is that, and forgive me, I'm going to treat me like I'm stupid. Okay. And, and cause this is, I really want to make sure people understand this. The goal of these shows is really to educate people. Right. So, so say this is my vape, this is my pen pen, but say this is my, this is the battery for my vape pen and this is my right. cartridge. Right. Yes. yes. Is, is the coil in the battery or is it in the yes. cartridge? It's in the battery. So it's in the battery, right? And now the cartridge, which we're getting, that's what's got the 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 liquid inside has the propylene glycol and these other things that are just chemicals to be um, like binders and fillers. That's what I call it. I used to be a yeah. pharmacy tech. So it's like, oh. it's whatever they put to make it liquid, right? Yeah, like as I described before, for the flavor, because let's, that tastes oh, right. kind of bad. They add the terpenes to make it flavorful, just like Juul had the flavors in theirs. And Juul got into big trouble. As you, do you remember the whole thing with Juul? All of a sudden, um, everyone was um, consuming, instead of consuming, um, like one little pod in a jewel was equal to a pack of cigarettes. So you had kids that were consuming multiple packs of cigarettes worth of jewel. That's so gross. And um, they actually are now suing them. I know in my state uh, because they felt like that was again, targeting to the youth because I have to say, when you look at alcohol, when you look at cigarettes, especially alcohol, you have an industry where 75% of the product is bought by 25% of the users. I want you, and the same in marijuana, I would be a heavy user by the time I didn't start off as a heavy user, but by the time I started consuming the concentrates, I became a heavy user and I was just consuming more and more and more. And that's eventually what I believe the industry wants are these heavy users. So um, we just, did, are you listening? Mm -hmm. Is it the, her audio just went funny? Is that just my headphones or is that my fault or is that something? Say something for me, Ann. Okay. Can you hear me? You hear that? Yes. Does it sound funky? It's a little tinny. Yeah. You just got a little far away for some reason. We'll keep talking. Maybe it'll correct itself. Um, I can still hear you. So I'm assuming everybody else can still hear you too. Um, Ray says billboards will be everywhere and seen by all. How will this influence the youth and society? And then okay, some I, don't think about that. I don't think Vermont has billboards. No, they we don't. Have, but let me tell you, I see them all the time. There's a billboard when I drive near me that says cannabis is good for Springfield. Okay. That's a billboard. <laughs> okay. And then there's another one. You like this one. You know what it said? Tis the season to buy weed. And the next billboard, come by and say hi. <laughs> so I, I have an issue with that because I, I don't think that this is really being 
thought out as to what about like if, let's just face it if you're gonna say something is illegal let's people do it but that's just it's true people don't want to look at it but when you make it legal and then advertise and then push it as being a medicine and healthy you're going to increase the rates so and your sound is getting worse gradually worse um i'm not sure do you do you have plenty of power on your phone yes what can, if you would and uh leave the broadcast and then log back in okay um, we'll see if that helps I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to do this without her for a little bit. Um, Ray, yes. Store signs. Um, you are not joking about that. Okay. She came right back in. Hopefully that makes it easy. All right. Let's try that now. Can you hear me? Oh, much better. Yeah. We got you. Yeah. Back. Um, I, I just think it's sad with those billboards in my state. They weren't supposed to have billboards. You were not supposed to have advertising related to marijuana to a population that had um, at least uh, 25% under 21. And in California, they banned marijuana billboards, but they still made their way up. Yeah. I was going to say, I saw mad yep. men billboards and I yep. probably shouldn't be advertising for people on my show, but there were definitely weed billboards in LA when we lived out there. Um, and one of the things I I've been listening to, um, uh, somebody down at the Howard center in his testimony, he was saying that even though you aren't, even though we aren't advertising, even though there isn't billboards up advertising marijuana, the normalization of it and this rhetoric that, oh, it's good for you. And it's medicine. Oh, marijuana is medicine. It's medicine. It's medicine. It's medicine is telling people that there really are not side effects for it. Right. Right. And then you're going to have what I have here in um, the Pioneer Valley. You're going to have marijuana smelled everywhere on the streets. People are smoking with impunity. They don't care. And it's sad because even... Um, I read about the YMCA, they have a daycare and they wrote a, a memo for parents saying, please do a smell check of your kids before you drop them off. So they're not reeking of marijuana. Well, you know what? They got into trouble for saying that instead of like maybe some parents saying I should not be driving in my car with marijuana, you know, hot boxing my kid. Instead, they had to apologize for even suggesting that 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 was not a good thing to have your kid reeking of marijuana. So we, we can't have secondhand cigarette smoke and that is the worst thing in the world. And if you smoke out in public, you're the devil for smoking around people, but you can't, <laughs> but the why yeah. had to apologize for children smelling like weed when they came in. Yes. And then also wow. I have to say, you're going to make cannabis consumption sites. They're working on that. Well, how's that going to work? Consumption sites. Yes. Like you're going to go into a, <sighs> But we don't have indoor smoking, so I don't know. Maybe it'll be edibles. Yeah, the next thing will be now people, let's face it. Let's say you live in public housing and you can't smoke your marijuana. Well, Erica, you have to go somewhere and use it. We need to have a location oh, where you can use like it. Designated smoking areas, basically. Or wow. a cafe. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's gone too far. I never thought any of this was going to happen. I thought it was a good thing that, right. again, people would have... Uh, the opportunity to consume what at that point I thought was not harmful, but it's gone over the top. It's really been kind of remarkable to see what's happened. Now I remember uh, you mentioning, and I, and I think I read it somewhere else about heavy metal toxicity from smoking marijuana. How does that happen? That's right. I was actually heavy metal poisoned when That's I left. Right. Yep. And that was a big problem. Um, I have this whole book. Measuring heavy metals, contaminants, and cannabis and hemp, it's a problem. This writer is saying that we don't have the testing that we have done. We only test for four heavy metals. There are many more. But if you have fertilizers, if you have nutrients, because they're, again, growing this oh. hydroponically. And a lot you might know people who do hydroponics, but they don't want to do it with, again, anything that's harmful. But wow. if they can get away with it, you have, again insecticides you have nutrients you have fertilizers and that all has metals in it it can like have liquid. like yep or you know what else i learned i learned that let's say you have your plant drenched in the pesticides 
Maybe some are approved, maybe not. But when you're making the cannabis concentrate with butane and propane, that makes a reaction that increases the heavy metals. So basically there's all this science to growing and people who are not thoughtful or careful about it are poisoning people basically without maybe intent or maybe knowingly, but maybe even unknowingly. Well, it's upsetting people. Like even this cannabis book, again, written by really, you know, people who support cannabis are saying they're unethical people out there mm. in terms of production and had, had a chapter on heavy metals and pesticides that I was reading. And it, it's just a dark underbelly of the industry that people don't know about. So what do you think about, what do you think would be a good solution? Do you think government should just stay out of it? Um, keep it, you know, like in Vermont, as an example, it's not legal technically, it's just decriminalized. And if you are a person, you can grow your own plants. Somebody <clears throat> write in the chat, I used to know what the answer was. You can have like three adult plants and like five immature plants. Do not quote me, anybody. Right. Do not make your decisions based on what I just said. But it's something like you can have so many adult plants and then some whatever, and then you can give it to your friends or, you know, you can give it away or you can smoke it, but you just can't sell it. Um, do you think that's a reasonable thing? Or do you think we should go back to it being on, you know, a schedule? What is that? A schedule A narcotic? What do you think about any of that, all that stuff? It's Still, um, it's still a schedule one. I schedule mean, one, that's what it is. The fact is, I don't see a way, even in terms of with just people growing it, people grow a lot more. They really do. I have to admit, I've known people. In, in Massachusetts, you can have six per person. You can have up to 12 plants. Well, you can grow these really big plants. And the hard thing is this. Let's say someone has their 12 reeking plants outdoors and there's someone who lives next door. It, what, is that fair to them, Erica? At what point are you infringing on someone else's um, ability to enjoy their lives? Well, that's a good question. And that's what, you know, it was funny. We were joking about growing some at, in our backyard which is right on the bike path in Burlington. And I was like, they would immediately get stolen. Like we would never be able to get away with that. <laughs> and I wouldn't want it in the house. And I wouldn't like, for what? And like, it just, it creates a lot of interesting conversations. And, and I just think, you know, if we know that the government is terrible at everything and they yes. just have a tendency to screw stuff up, how do we do this in a way that's reasonable, fair, and just? Well, the thing that worries me about national, you know, federal um, national uh, legalization is that the marijuana lobbyists will become so powerful. They already mm. are getting so powerful. I think they spent, you know, they're spending millions and millions and pumping it and pumping it. And yeah, you do have people that are trying to to stand up against them, but they're just being bulldozed because it's so much money. It's going to become so powerful. And it's global. I didn't realize the global implications. Now they're talking about how this is going to be something exported between countries and this and that. And, and maybe one day someone said, Ann, why are you so worked up about it? One day you're going to go to a convenience store, go to Cumberland Farms, and they're going to have packs of joints. And I thought, that's really sad. I'm not looking <laughs> forward to that. <laughs> Well, here's here's my thing. Oh, Ray, thank you. He said it's three and three. So three immature and three yeah. mature. Here was the thing that I found uh, really concerning about it all. You know, when, you know, we talk about what weed was like, you know, back in the day when it was just grown and it was just normal and people weren't doing this uh, hybridization and genetically modifying and, you know, like we've done to our food, which a lot of people have suggested has made us sick, that all this genetic modification we're doing to our food and all this processing is making us sick. And then we're going to do the same thing to a, a medicinal plant, you know, that has legitimate medicinal purposes and is used in various religions, ceremonies. So it's, it's legit. Like it has a purpose. I get it. We're going to take this thing. We're going to, we're going to screw it up because that's what we do. 
And then we're just going to make people sick. Yeah. And uh, one of the testimonies I heard was that in the 2019 uh, youth risk behavior survey. So in Vermont, they do this youth risk behavior survey. And that in 2019, uh, we saw a huge spike in uh, suicidality and uh, more than normal, but also in correlation, maybe, maybe not, maybe causation, maybe not, a huge increase in marijuana use. So at the right. same so at the same time we're decriminalizing it and telling everybody that it's medicine, young people are using it more and having a higher risk of suicidality, suicidal thoughts and attempts. Yeah, especially out in Colorado, they had even a greater than Vermont because in that culture it's been there longer. Hmm. I think 2012 is when they started doing really um, more medicinal. They were one of the first to do, um, even before California, they did uh, mm -hmm. actually uh, recreational. And yes, what about that? And I know that I consumed it. Why I eventually stopped is it was producing, after dabbing that high potency THC concentrates, I never had a psychological problem and I wanted to end my life. So when people tell me that that is related, I understand because it brought me to a dark place. I never thought marijuana could do that because again, I was used to the 1980s marijuana, the 1990s marijuana getting stronger. I wasn't any way ready for what this is now. I call it Frankenweed. I think <laughs> it's an abomination and I think it's disgusting. Do we so, have to make it toxic and dangerous to this extent? And that's what, so for people that don't know, for anybody that's watching and doesn't know, dab, and for, I'm trying to remember all the different terms. There's dab, shatter, glass, or something. Isn't there like a bunch of names for it? Well, you have the cannabis concentrate. It's what I said before. You take the cannabis and you strip it with the butane and propane or CO2 extraction. The thing is you have a highly concentrated concentrate. It can be, and you dab it. And that's when you take a little bit of the shatter or the wax. And, and it's you basically just like a little, it's basically just like a waxy, like a little ball of resin. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then you heat it. But I'm telling you, it's very powerful. I right. had never, I mean, I just remember that first time I tried it. And then, of course, it was like you, it's like you got high for the first time and then some. That's well, people. People are reporting that you can be a decade smoker and smoke that. And it's like over the top. The problem is once you smoke that, the concentrate, you can't go back to the flower because it mm, doesn't give you the same high. It's like crack cocaine versus just powder cocaine. The high is stronger, exactly. more intense, um, but leaves you wanting essentially. Well, it's interesting that the mar that marijuana, uh, it stimulates the same receptors in the brain as the opiates. So there is a correlation. People say that, oh, we need to have the marijuana because it'll stop people from you know, being on opiates. And that's just not true. There might be some people who say that happens. But if you look at the, in fact, the surveys of what's happening in the studies, it, it isn't helping. That's really interesting. I did not know that. Well, and I've read studies. This was back when I was looking at quitting smoking and a mentor of mine in recovery talked about how if you are, uh, if you are, you know, trying to abstain from, you know, alcohol, whatever, if there's anything that you hold on to that you're addicted to, then you are more likely to relapse on whatever it is you're trying to abstain from. So he said if that the studies showed that if you were a recovering alcoholic, as an example, but you did not quit smoking or if you quit smoking as well, you were less likely to go back to abusing alcohol because you'd gotten rid of all of your addictive behaviors, basically. Yeah, it's really interesting. You have your brain and you have dopamine and dopamine can be a natural reward. Let's say, Erica. Yeah. Your husband says something nice to you, or you do something nice for him. It's just a good feeling. But unfortunately, as a society, we're not content with that. Instead, we're getting swept up in these actual a uh, drug producing that. And whereas, let's say, if I go on a bike ride and my dopamine and I'm feeling good, but when I was doing the shatter, it jacks it up to here. So I could not feel anything 
positive unless I my brain was stimulated to that level with the concentrate. Well, and now that let you know talking about America as a whole, right? So we well, okay, let me take a step back. So Vermont we have one of the higher rates of suicidality in the country, uh, higher than the national average, which people mm. don't talk about. We also have a huge problem with opioid addiction. Uh, a lot of these problems correlate with economic activity. So if people don't have jobs, if people don't have hope for the future, they're more likely to be consuming things to try to make themselves feel better. And when we're talking about the United States as a whole, where we are hyping up those uh, neurotransmitter releases, right? So we drink a ton of soda that dumps uh, various neurotransmitters in our brain, eating fast food, right? McDonald's knows exactly how much fat, sugar, and salt to put in their food to make a dopamine kick in your brain so that you'll become addicted to it. Like we know that they've been doing these psychological things to our foods and all that other stuff. And now, so now we have a, a more depressed, especially now with COVID. Right. So we have all these deaths of despair already. And then we make even more available this thing that looks like it's going to help you feel better, but it's really just like pot smoke and mirrors, like you said. Well, people actually, I thought that I was feeling better from it because actually, if you're on, as you say, hallucinogen, how do you know how you're really feeling? What's happening to your brain? You don't know. Yeah. And that said, and you bring up a good point because actually the rates of uh, alcohol and marijuana use are unprecedented. And look what's happening in the world. It, it's really sad. And again, I feel for Vermont. Vermont has the number one in terms of college marijuana use because Vermont was a very much, um, you know, going back to, I guess, uh, Woodstock and all that. A lot of people came <laughs> up there. I, it did happen. Oh, yeah. And it's a beautiful state. It's very outdoorsy. But UVM, I, UVM was rated number one party school in the nation multiple wow. years in a row by Rolling Stone magazine. And that's incredible, even compared to California. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's what, you know, we have all these big name uh, music groups like Wu-Tang comes know, to Burlington, Wu you know? Yeah. And people are like, what? Really? And I'm like, yeah, this is known as a place that you can come, let your freak flag fly, whatever it is. <laughs> And then get into some uh, get into some nonsense. But it's I know what really bothers me though about everything is that out in Portland they um, they basically decriminalize uh, let's say three and a half grams of meth, three and a half grams of heroin, forty tabs of acid. So what's going to happen with that? What's going to happen there? More people are going to be using drugs, and they want to say, but people use drugs anyway. We might as well do the harm reductionist thing, but mm. I really think that's a bad way to go because you do have people that are openly using IV drugs. And I don't think that that is good for, for people to see. Yeah. And yeah. at what point again, is it their right to do that? And how, what about other people who don't want to do that? But I feel right. like right now our society is just not, it's not going in a good direction. No, we're definitely very dysfunctional <laughs> as a whole overall. Um, so, Anne, we have come around the hour. And so I just want to give you a moment to take, you know, take a couple of minutes to share any last thoughts that you have with folks, anything that you want to make sure um, that either, either make sure we talk about or, you know, just like a closing statement or whatever you want to share with folks. Well, I've talked to, I've been up to Vermont to tell people about the industry and what's really happening in the marijuana industry. They're touting it as being healthy and, and it's, you may go in these stores and they seem so clean, but you don't understand really how the product's being grown. You have assurances of people who are actually in the business to make as much money as possible. And it's just a shame. I have to say, I thought that again, commercialization would be a good thing. And I became a part and I worked in it. And I realized that I had been duped and actually I was duped to harm others. So I actually got out. 
And I have like, I remember you told me, Erica, you don't have any skin in the game. You don't, hey, you're just doing this because you want to inform people. And me too. When I went down to the FDA to speak, I went so by my own means and paying for it. And I've been ignored by politicians and officials. And that's going to keep up, actually. I don't see a way that this will be widely shared with people. So I appreciate you, Erica, by letting me tell people because that makes a difference. Yeah. And I really fear for what's going to happen. I would say in another 10 years, there are going to be a lot of weird cancers and there are going to be a mm. lot of people with psychological problems, maybe even who knows what the aftermath will be. But maybe then people will wake up. I just wished people could wake up sooner. But I guess it comes down to it's just what the system is. The system is greater than you. It's greater than me. Yeah. But I want the people to be very wary. Right now, it's happening. You're going to have commercialization. But by all means, if you start seeing advertising everywhere and things that shouldn't be happening, then I would get involved. Stand up and say something. But people I, don't do that <clears throat> now. So you got to stand up. Yep. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. Yep. I so appreciate it. Um, what I would love to, and I'm going to write this down. I want to see if I can get somebody, the the uh, folks from like the Howard Center and stuff that I heard uh, testifying. Uh, I'm sure they have resources that they can share with people. I'm going to look to see if they have something that we can post in the comments for people to go look at. But I would also just encourage people, if you have questions about this, if you have concerns, do a little bit of research about it. Uh, go to the Howard Center, call the Howard Center and ask them for their opinion and what they think about things. Don't just take a politician's word that something is fine. Um, at one point they told us cigarettes were fine. At one point right. you could Opiate. get speed prescribed to you or over the counter. At one point, uh, you know, you could get all of these things and nobody cared. And, you know, the libertarian side of me kind of like, was like, just legalize everything and then we'll deal with it, you know, and then, you know, all this stuff. But at the same time, what the reason I do this show is because I want to help facilitate an engaged and informed community. I want people to know what is going on, what their options are, what we're dealing with, and give a voice to people who otherwise wouldn't have one because it is so easy to just go, oh, well, they said it was fine, so I guess it's fine, and then just take people's words for it. And I and I and so I just am so grateful that you are willing to share your story, share your experience. Uh, even though it's probably uncomfortable sometimes and uh, and and it's got to be frustrating when people don't, you know, don't give all sides uh, the same respect to be heard and uh, considered by the public. So uh, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us this evening. If you have any questions, feel free to keep commenting. Thank you, Ray, for joining us. Uh, and keep questions, you know, keep commenting and asking questions. If there's anything, uh, and can answer, I can help answer. We'll see about getting stuff from the Howard center and, uh, come visit us next week for the next show. Uh, next week is Dan French, a doctor in rhetoric. And we're going to be talking about why people are so bad at talking to one another and how come we've, and how we've ended up in this uh, polarized position rather than uh, being able to just talk and persuade one another. So, and hold on with me for one moment while I end the broadcast. Thank you, everyone. Good night. See you next week. Oh, actually, hold on. And a little teaser. There's going to be a new news program, a new generally irritable news program coming out. So be on the lookout for it. Okay. I'm really ending the broadcast now.